Good morning everyone and thank you for joining the webinar today. My name is Tori Jaffa and I'm the Marketing and Events Officer at Connecting Up and TechSoup New Zealand. Our webinar today is an introduction to Office 365 for nonprofits and is presented by Ryan Jones. Ryan is passionate about technology, entrepreneurship, video production and all things motorsport and brings with him many years experience in technology and startups. We'll have a question and answer se session um, right at the end of the webinar. So if you have any questions, please type them in the question box on your webinar panel. Uh, Ryan will go through a demo, so um, keep, keep a look out for that. And I'll now hand it over to Ryan. All yours, Ryan. Thanks, Tori, and welcome everyone today. Uh, as Tori said, this is mainly about the demo because Office 365 is a lot easier to get your head around if you can actually see it working. So um, I'm happy to take questions throughout the webinar, but uh, bulk of your questions will probably be answered when we get into the demo. So be vocal, but don't be don't be upset if we leave your questions until the end if they're related to the demo. So I guess the first thing that we need to talk about here is what is Office 365? So what we're talking about today is not the same as the Office 365 personal versions that you can buy from JB Hi-Fi or Harvey Norman. It's, it's essentially Microsoft Office in the cloud. Why would we want to do that? Well, there's a few different reasons why we'd want to do that. But let's start with the benefits of cloud software. So most of us are probably already using some form of cloud, even if we're not familiar or not aware. There are a few key benefits that we should look at. Um, one is really centered around flexibility. You have no idea the number of not-for-profit organizations who come to us and go, you know, we need to add one more user to our server, but it can't fit it. What are we supposed to do? Yeah, and, and organizations are faced with the prospect of spending thousands, tens of thousands of dollars to upgrade a server just to add one user. Having this cloud technology in front of us, we have the capacity to add users and scale our solution without any hardware investment. It's as easy as clicking a couple of buttons. Office 365 is reliable. It's hosted with guaranteed service by Microsoft. They have multiple data centers particularly in Australia, there's a Sydney and a Melbourne data center now, and automated backup, so we don't have to stress about that. And it's always up to date, which for many organizations, we can't underestimate the benefit of having all of our users on, always on the same version. And this basically gives us peace of mind. So they're the benefits of cloud software, but what happens when we put Office in the cloud? A couple of different things, if my slide will advance. You can access your data wherever you want to, in including, including at home, just out of interest. You can access your data wherever you want it because it's stored centrally. It's stored centrally on OneDrive, so all of your organization can access all of your files whenever they need to. You've obviously got security, so files are segmented out and you can give different people in the organization different levels of access, but you have all of your files stored centrally and backed up. You have the opportunity for online co collaboration, which we're going to demo shortly, but that basically involves being able to edit files at the same time. You have automated backups, which I mentioned before. And one of the key things here is that there's no need to run your own servers. Now this is often, a lot of what we can do here with Office 365 is something that we've been able to do for a very long time. However, it's been out of reach of most of us, whether it's the cost of the server hardware, whether it's the expertise and the time to get it set up, it just wasn't possible for a lot of us. But now, Microsoft are gonna run the servers for us and it makes it a lot more achievable for all of us. So let's have another look at what Office 365 actually is. So you can see we start with Microsoft Office, same version of Microsoft Office that we've been using for ever. 
Um, but we're getting web-based versions with one of the plans. And you'll notice there that, that there's no access or publisher. We'll talk about that in a minute. But the online version allows us to work collaboratively on our documents. It allows us to pick up where we left off on different devices. So I can start editing a Word document on my computer and then I can jump on my tablet on the train on the way home and I can continue editing where I left off uh, without any break in continuity. Now, for us, I mean, I know lots of you are probably super organised and everything is always done well ahead of the due date, but for us, grant proposals can be a bit of an issue for us. Often, you know, we sort of get to the last week that they're due and crisis meeting and we need to get them organised. So what we can do now, you know, what we used to do was cut up the grant proposal into separate sections, emailed it off to all kinds of different people, they would produce their section and then we'd all need to come together, put the file together and edit it so that it made sense. Now what we can do is we can edit it all together in real time. It's all in the one document straight away. If we see something in there that we don't agree with or there's a different writing style or something like that, we can go to that person and talk to them straight away. Um, and it makes the whole process a lot more streamlined. But we're also getting a few other things here. We're getting business class email, which is hosted Microsoft Exchange email. We're getting file sharing through OneDrive for Business. We're getting high definition video conferencing through Skype for Business. Technical support, a 99.9% .9 uptime service level agreement, which basically means that Microsoft are committing to having Office 365 online for 99.9% .9 of the month. Uh, I think the last few months it's been 99.98. So they're doing a pretty good job. We also get pretty easy IT management uh, and access to those documents everywhere, like we were saying before. Um, SharePoint is also included there, which is part of the file sharing bundle, but we will look at that in more in detail in the demo. So Exchange Online. Many of you are probably already using Exchange. Exchange Online gives us powerful web-based email. We can still check our Exchange inboxes hosted in Office 365 in Outlook on our computer the same way we've always done. In fact, that's the way that Connecting Up did it when we moved to Office 365. Somebody came around in the morning and changed the server that staff were getting emails from and it picked up as if nothing had changed. We get shared calendars. We can use those shared calendars to manage organisational assets. That might be meeting rooms, for some organisations it's cars, data projectors, whatever it might be. You get a huge 50 gigabytes of storage per user, access to your email via mobile apps, and you also get great security and privacy protections just to protect everything against the nefarious folk. Skype for Business. Now, this used to be called Link, so if you're more familiar with Link, then this is Link. But whenever somebody came to you and said, what is Link? You kind of go, well, you know Skype? Yeah, yeah, I know Skype. Well, it's kind of like Skype, except for business. So after Microsoft bought Skype, it's taken them a couple of years, but they merged all the technology together into Skype for Business and given it the name that people were nicknaming it for years. Skype for Business is great. One of the reasons why Skype for Business is great is because you start to get the benefits of having the integrated approach that Office 365 gives us. Skype for Business integrates with Exchange, knows when you're in a meeting. So it puts real-time presence information into your feed. So if I go to set a meeting with Tori, who was talking before, and if I tried to do that at the moment, I would see in her calendar that she's got a meeting for a webinar. So it would tell me that she's away from the computer and I can't talk to her, she's busy. It tells me, you can see I've got a little red line. Have I got a cursor? Yes. I've got a little red line there that says busy. 
This bloke here, he's got a green line, so that green line indicates that he's available. And I've got a yellow line here next to this lady. Uh, the yellow line indicates that that person doesn't have anything in their calendar, but they have been away from their computer for 15 minutes. So they haven't been using their computer, so they're probably not around. I can try them, but they're probably not around. This is really good for short, quick text chat about little things, but we can also scale this to voice chat, high definition video chat, uh, screen sharing, a virtual whiteboard so we can run meetings, particularly if you've got remote staff, that's brilliant. Um, and the, uh, the screen control is really good because what I can actually do is I can give a colleague access to my screen, but I can limit it to an application. So I've got a colleague in the office that some of you would probably know, Tina. Tina's really good at Excel formulas. Me, well, I'm not so good. So if I need help with an Excel formula, I can quickly check whether Tina's available. If she's available, I can send her a brief message. Just go, hey Tina, can you give me a hand with this Excel formula? And then I can give her screen control just to Excel. She can't have access to my email. She can't do anything behind the scenes of the computer. She can't reconfigure anything. Everything's very secure. Um, so we can have group high definition chat. I forgot to update something. It's not five people anymore. The group high definition chat is pretty much limited to the bandwidth you've got available in your internet connection. Some of our Microsoft contacts have had high definition video chats with 100 people or more and it works just fine, but it does start to struggle to download everything at the time. You can invite external people into your Skype for Business meetings and you also get a great suite of mobile apps for Windows Phone, Android and iOS, which is really cool particularly when those mobile apps actually support the voice or video chat. So you, colleagues can ring you over Link, which you, or I think it's still Link in the App Store actually. Um, and they can give you a call while you're traveling or whatever it is and it uses data rather than the phone connection. So I find that to be really useful if you're overseas. It picks up on the data and you just need to make sure that your phone's got a data pack on it. When I go overseas, I just pick up a new SIM card with a bit of data on it. So I've got a new number that people can't necessarily ring me on. So that is a really useful tool. So before we go into the demo, this is the different plans that are on offer. So you can see we've got non-profit business essentials. These have been renamed and reshaped slightly recently. But you can see we've got non-profit business essentials and non-profit E1 that are both a pure donation. And there's one big thing that both of those plans don't include and that is the office desktop applications. So if you are using non-profit business essentials or non-profit E1 and you need a desktop copy of office, then you can still request that through the Microsoft donation program. Some organizations will already have licenses of Office 2010 or Office 2013 that they want to use. That's just fine. Um, connecting up, all of our staff are on Nonprofit E1 and all of our staff already had Office 2013 on their computers. So the Nonprofit Business Premium and the Nonprofit E3 are discounted. They come with the desktop client but if you've already got a desktop client, you can save some money and go straight to E1. You can see there are a few other differences here. The non-profit business plans are now limited to 300 users. That used to be 25. Microsoft have this kind of crazy thing that when people start to max out the um, limitations of their plans, they just increase them. OneDrive data storage used to be 100 gigabytes and then people started reaching their 100 gigabytes. So then they increased it to a terabyte and then some crazy people started hitting the terabytes and now they've just made it unlimited. So they've done the same thing here. Nonprofit business plans are now 300 user limits. 
the non-profit E1 and E3 are unlimited numbers of users. Now, before I go on, does anyone have any questions on what I've presented so far, or particularly the, the plan differences? We do have a question from Jeff. Um, it's in regards to Skype, actually. Do external people have to download something to join Skype? No, they can use the um, Skype web app. So you can give them a link and they can click onto a web browser and they can access it through that. And Henry asks, is this hosted by Microsoft or Telstra? Hosted by Microsoft. Great, that's all for now. Great. Yeah, so Telstra still resell Office 365, but um, Microsoft have got their own data centres in Melbourne and Sydney now. So if you sign up to Office 365 now, you will automatically get put onto a Microsoft data center in Melbourne or Sydney. Um, if you signed up to Office 365 before, oh, I want to say March this year, then um, you probably would have been put into a Microsoft data center in Singapore, which was what, Microsoft, uh, what Telstra were reselling. All right. So we'll send these slides out afterwards and you can have a bit of a look at the plans in more detail. Um, how do you get it? All you need to do is go to the Microsoft website, microsoft.com slash Office 365 Nonprofits. It has a bit more information there and it shows a bit more information about the differences in plans. There might be some more in-depth reasons why you might want to choose one over the other. There's a bit more complex stuff behind the scenes, but um, go to that page, get registered and get ready to go. And that is the end of that. Before we start the, now, hope, sorry Ryan, before we start the demo, are we able to just answer a few more questions in regards to plans? Sure, absolutely. Um, are these plan Matthew up. asks, are these plans volume license um, and as a Microsoft reseller, can we get them cheaper and on charge to the customer? No, the not-for-profit needs to register themselves. You can register on their behalf, but all of the donated Microsoft licenses need to be owned and retained by the not-for-profit organisation. And Margaret asks, what does Office Online refer to? I'm going to show you that in two seconds. Um, Tim asks, can you explain the advanced services? Is that what you're going to explain now, I think? No, so advanced services for most organisations, Active Directory integration is important. Um, On-premises server integration is important. So it is possible to retain an on-premise server for users, passwords, things like that. Um, there's also some differences around uh, business intelligence and uh, email archiving. That might be a difference why you would go for something like E1 or E3 over the non-profit business essentials. You can see on the, the chart there, if you want Active Directory integration, you need um, E1 or E3, whereas you can see that with E3, you get more advanced on-premise server integration and legal hold and archiving and things like that. So yeah. I'm not going to go into that in too much detail because that is probably depending on your requirements. And Corey asks, is there a large bandwidth requirement to use Office 365? Depends on what you're doing with it. So if you came to us and said, look, I've got um, 20 users and they all want to, um, you know, they're all going to get their email from Office 365, they're all going to be using collaborative document editing all the time, they're going to be on Skype for Business doing video conferencing nonstop then yes, there is a large bandwidth consideration. If you are just doing email, um, the occasional bit of Skype, file storage, then it's not going to be quite as big. So it depends on the number of users and what they're doing with it. The example I like to bring up is an organization I visited last year and I was talking to them about this and they went, look, we just don't have the bandwidth available to us. All right, all right, fair enough. What are you using for email at the moment? We're using Gmail, okay? 
which is exactly replaced by Exchange essentially, except with more functionality. What are you using for file storage? We're using Dropbox. Okay, well you can use OneDrive for Business for that instead. Uh, what are you using for video conferencing? Are you using anything? Oh yes, we're using Skype. Okay, so then they were also using Spotify for music streaming. They were using a range of other tools that were consuming bandwidth. So the reality was this organization was already doing bits of what Office 365 can do all over the place without an integrated approach, but they were already using the same kind of bandwidth that Office 365 would use. So you need to have a look at what you're doing with your bandwidth, what your users are going to do, and then decide on your way forward. I think that's actually part of next week's webinar with Matt, but we will, Matt from Info Exchange, so we will send out details for that after the webinar. Uh, Pauline asks, are we still able to use customised CMS systems currently on our server on Office 365? Yes, so what you can do with Office 365 is you can use it just for email calendar, all those kind of things, and your existing public website is completely separate. And um, we've got two questions from Leona in regards to Skype. How do we use the whiteboard function in Skype and how does the Skype for Business app work? She hasn't succeeded downloading um, any external users um, that have Office 365 logins but are using their own computers. I'm, that's actually the only thing that I'm not going to demo today because it doesn't actually work very well to demo a video tool over a webinar platform. Um, it's something that we do when we do these events face to face though. So what I'd probably do is take that one offline and we'll get back to you and, and give you some tips on that. Um, and Nayaz asks, can we get the mixed Office 365 plan, plan i.e. 100 users at the organisation and 30 users will be using E1 and 70 will be using E2 for one company? Uh, you mean E3? Yes, you can do that. You can't, you can't mix non-profit business essentials and uh, you can't mix non-profit business and non-profit E1 uh, and you can't easily transfer from non-profit business essentials, let's say, to non-profit E1. But from E1 to E3 is relatively easy, and from non-profit business essentials to non-profit business premium is pretty easy. But at this stage, you don't want to transition from non-profit business essentials to non-profit E1, which is why it's important to pick the right plan from day dot. And Matthew asks, this question may have been asked, but is there any hosting for this in Brisbane, Australia? And if so, through what data centre? There's no Brisbane data at, uh, data centre at this stage. Um, if Brisbane location is important to you, though, Connecting Up does offer a infrastructure as a service offering discounted in Brisbane through RNG Technologies Brisbane data centre. Awesome, and Peter just has one last question. I work for a volunteer referral service with around 50 volunteers a week, but we only have 18 workstations. Is there an option to pay per device or do we have to pay for 50 users? Well, what I would do if you're using um, volunteers, you're working with volunteers, is I would put them all on a non-profit E1 plan, which there is no cost associated with. So you could have 100 volunteers and the cost would be the same, it'd be nothing. Uh, and then those volunteers can access what they need from computers in the office or they can access what they need from computers remotely. Um, that's probably one of the best things about Office 365. Your um, volunteers can get access to the same technology that your staff have without large overheads for your organisation. Um, Alison asks, what is Active Directory integration? Uh, Active Direct if you're already using Active Directory in your organisation, you've got a small business server or something and you're using Active Directory for user and password management, then um, you can integrate that with Office 365 so that the passwords and permissions stay the same. Um, if you're not sure what it is, you're probably not using it, but it, if you've got an IT provider, it's best to discuss it with them. And um, Henry asks, how does OneDrive work as a as compared to a local file server? Do you, we still see public folders and do we set folder privileges? 
if you're using it for public file access, then what I would suggest is you would want to look at SharePoint, which is what I'm going to demo in a sec. Um, so treat OneDrive for Business as your user folder. So um, for I think for us it's a J drive where you can store your files that you're not necessarily sharing with other people. Whereas SharePoint is your communal data storage for the entire organization. And once you're into that communal data storage, you can have separate SharePoint sites, you can have separate um, file storage, and you can set your permissions accordingly. That's all for now. Excellent. All right, let's get on with some demos. Hey. All right. So when you first go to Office 365, you go to, oh, I'm already logged in, so you don't go to the login page. You get a page like this that basically gives you access to all of your, um, all of your tools straight away. So when we look at mail, calendar and people, that's all things that are managed by Exchange, Newsfeed and Sites and Tasks to an extent is SharePoint. OneDrive is your file storage. We have Delve now. We have video um, video storage, and we have our office online. Now, I quickly demo email because often people haven't seen it, but it works very similar to if anyone's already using Exchange. It works very similar to that. You can have shared mailboxes. You can access it on different computers. You can do all that kind of thing. So you can see here, and this is probably the thing I like the most about the way that they've implemented Office 365. You can see here that if you are an Office 2013 user, this looks a lot like Outlook 2013. So it's actually not that much different. I don't see any embarrassing emails, so that's good. Um, we can get access to things the same way that we've always accessed them. Uh, so it's relatively easy to take a user who's not experienced in Office 365 and get them using this kind of technology. You can still use Outlook on your computer. I'm just choosing to demo uh, Outlook on Office 365 because it's the different part, I guess. So we also have access to our calendar. And Tori, please interrupt me if we've got questions. And I was talking before about rooms. So we have shared calendars at Connecting Up so that we can make meetings with each other and, and know that the time is free or busy. You can see here that we've got a meeting room. I can pull up the meeting rooms calendar and I can see when the meeting room is busy or not busy. And we can make meetings accordingly knowing that the room is free. And like I said before, I've seen other organizations use this for assets like cars, uh, assets like um, projectors, um, shared assets that people often need access to. This is all things that you can do in exchange, but often I find that people haven't actually seen it before. So that's what it is. If you're already using exchange, you can probably already do this. But you can see that the experience on the web version is very, very, very close to the experience that you have been getting on the desktop version, which is pretty cool. Now, I'm going to go straight to OneDrive. I'm going to jump around a little bit. So OneDrive is my user storage, I was saying before. And I keep getting email. It's really noisy. OK. Here's my document storage. This is all looks very interesting. It is all um, just a standard file structure. I can have folders within folders. Uh, I can share different files. You can see some of these are shared, some of them are not. But this is something that I would use for my files rather than for sharing with the entire organization. And you can use the OneDrive for Business Sync tool to sync all of these files down to your computer or you can sync some of them down to your computer which means that you can go offline if for example you need to get on a plane you're going to be somewhere that doesn't have an internet connection you can still access all of these files 
same as you can sync your email to your computer the same way that you've always done. Um, so if I open Office 365 webinar, what I'm going to do to start is you can see here I've got Excel, Word and PowerPoint files. What I'm going to do is I'm going to open this file here, which is something that I prepared earlier. And here's my file. It's a Word file. It's open in Word Online. And this kind of looks like Word, kind of. Looks like the Word viewer version. So what I can do here is I can edit, print, share, write comments. So if I edit, I can choose whether to edit in Word, in which case it brings it down to my computer, and I'm going to show you that in a sec. Or I can choose to edit in Word Online. So I can edit it straight in the web browser which is really useful if you're using somebody else's computer, you have to use something else, uh, you know, your computer gets destroyed, you have to use a, a um, internet cafe, whatever it is. And again, you can see here that the interface looks kind of like Word. But you can also see that somebody's decided to edit this file. This is the collaborative document editing that I was talking about before. So you can see here that my colleague, Sean, is currently editing this file. And I don't have to guess what he's doing here. I mean, I can see it, but I can also see where he is in real time in the document. Sean is currently editing the top line, and I can see all of his other changes. And this means that Sean and I can real time edit this file together. And yes, it is. We're in the same line. We're all fine. I can see that. He's underlined that text, and we could extend this much further if we wanted to. So we could use this to work on documents however we wanted to do. Now, I, I personally, I mean, the question I quite often get from people on this is, all right, so it's got a lot of the functionality that Microsoft Word has got, Word 2013 has got. How do you actually find it day to day? Um, I'll be honest, day to day, I'm an Office, I'm an Office 2013 kind of guy. I just prefer to work in the desktop version. There's nothing wrong with that. I can do that, no problems. But the online version probably does about 90%, 95% of what the desktop version does these days. So if I find that I've started editing this online and I want to make a change that I can't make in the web browser or I don't want to anymore. I can hit the open in Word button. And you can see here, we're saving the file and now it's going to open in Microsoft Word, which you can't see because it's on the other screen. And what it's going to do now is it's going to download the file. You can see the link there. It's downloading the file onto my computer. Let's put it on the other screen again. And here is my file. So I can see Sean's changes there, but you know I'm not losing the collaborative document editing. I can see that Sean is editing the document. It works slightly different on the desktop because it um, on the desktop, it locks out paragraphs rather than sentences. And if I save the file, what it's going to do, just save that now, you can see that there's a little sync icon there, which shows me that Sean's made a change there. And there's updates available. And I'm going to sync it. And there you go. Oh, that's really nice of you, Sean. Apparently, I am the best presenter ever. Okay, well, that's 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 really nice of Sean. But you can see that those updates, uh, it's warning me when they're available. It's telling me where they are so that I don't interfere with that paragraph. Um, and I'm getting an experience where we can both edit a file at the same time. Grant applications, like I was saying before, are brilliant for this. But we're still getting that file backed up in Office 365. In this case, it's OneDrive, but it could quite as easily be SharePoint. 
and all of the changes are real time reflected. And it's updating, and there you go, Sean's highlighted that in yellow, and that shows me the recent changes. I've probably had enough of that file, so I'm going to close it. I'm going to go back to my web browser, and you can see Sean's still editing it in the web browser. Now, you know, I don't really want to hurt Sean's feelings, but, and I know that he was, you know, giving me compliments and things, but I didn't really like his edits. So, we have full versioning with uh, Office 365. So, the files that are stored in uh, OneDrive, in SharePoint, I have version history. So, you can see that there's a little menu dialog next to this file. I can click on this. I can see who I've shared the file with and change the permissions if I want. I can see a little preview. I can also click here for more actions. I can open it, I can download it, I can share it. Here's my version history. So you can see here's the changes that Sean's made, here's some that I've made, here's some that we used for a previous webinar. So what I want to do here is I want to restore it back to my original file. I hit restore and something goes wrong. Let's try it again. Ah, oh, Sean's still in the file, I reckon. That's probably what it is. Sean, if you can just get out. So if somebody's still editing the file, it's not going to let me do that. But if I go in here and restore, there you go. And the great thing is, it's even though I've restored the 1.0 version, it's actually created a new version on top, which is 8.0. So if for some reason I want to go back and see the version that Sean was working on and just compare it to mine, I can do that. I can go back to his 7.0. If we were, um, if I synced this to my computer, jumped on a plane, wrote a thousand words, then got back to an internet connection and synced it and found that Sean had been working on the same file at the same time, it will give me an interface that lets me um, choose which changes to commit and which ones don't. I won't lose my changes just because I was in a plane. I won't lose my changes just because I was offline. I have the ability to compare and, and contrast and get them to work. Now, this doesn't just apply to files that are stored in here. You can create files directly from here. You can create PowerPoint presentations, Excel workbooks, Word, OneNote notebooks. Usually the one I get asked for the most is an Excel survey, which is a really good way of leveraging the technology that we have behind Office 365 to do something that a lot of us already do. So I'm going to call this document Webinar Demo Survey. And we call it OK. And now Microsoft is going to step me through the creation process of the survey. So hey, I've got an edit survey. I'm going to call this webinar survey. My description is going to be the best webinar survey ever. Enter my first question here. Is it text? Is it a paragraph? Is it a number? Date, time, yes, no, choice. Um, was this the best webinar you ever went to? And so I don't need a question subtitle in this case. This is a yes, no answer. It's required. The default value, I obviously want to be yes, and I can go done. So what I can do here is I can share this survey, and people can then start to complete it. What I might do, I can send this link to whoever I want to send it to. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to share it with myself at this point. 
So this is what your recipients will get when you send out the survey. I'm going to go submit. And what you see is in real time, any second wants to catch up, in real time the responses will go into the survey sheet, which makes it pretty cool. And we'll do another one. And so we're starting to get a data pool here. And so I can use that to set up graphs that are automatically going to pull in the responses. I can see how many responses I can get. I can automatically start analysing the data. Um, and I, I can see what's coming in as it's coming in. Uh, I've spoken to organisations that use this for membership forms. They use this for... Um, informational surveys, satisfaction surveys, things like that. The technology is there. I could have a bunch more questions if I wanted to. I just wanted to do a simple one for today. We have some uh, questions, the... Ryan. So when you're ready, let me Great. know. Sure, let's go. Um, so Edwin asks, is Office 365 usable in China? Um, as currently we use Google Drive and that's blocked in China. Uh, I would need to double check. I don't think it is, but if you can send us an email after the webinar, I'll check and get back to you. And Tim asks, how is a meeting room set up? Is it a user? No, it's set up as an asset. So it's similar to a user. It has an email um, address, just like a user. So we can invite it just like we would invite any other user. But it's configured as an asset, which lets us uh, where's my calendar? Which lets us do this. So if I set up meeting with Tori, my location, I can add a room. So it knows the time. It knows which rooms are available as a result because I'm making an appointment for 4.30 p.m. on Tuesday for half an hour. These rooms are all free. I can click on it there. And it adds the meeting room as an attendee. Meeting room has its own email address. And then I can add Tori. And I can put whatever I want in there. So yes, that's how it works. Is there, is there any limit to how many meeting rooms you can have? And not that I've seen, no. And Matthew asks, can you create security groups or will that only work there through integration? Uh, I think the answer is yes, but I probably need to look into that a bit more and get back to you. Um, so send through an email to events at connectingup.org um, and we can get back to you on that. Um, Daniel? I just, need to, I just need to validate whether that's available through 365 on its own or whether you need the Active Directory integration for that. Yep, great. Um, Daniel asks, we currently have a Citrix, Citrix network and want to keep our servers as our main storage. Can we save from Office 365 to our server? Um, there's a few different ways that you could do that. Um, for some organisations, they run the um, OneDrive for Business Sync tool on the server and they bring everything down. They have an admin user that's got access to all of the SharePoint documents, everything, and they store it all on the server. Um, it gets quite a bit more compl complex when you start to deal with Citrix. Um, so I guess the short version is yes, that's possible, but it's probably a question of whether it's a good idea or not. And Henry asks, how did Sean get access to the Word file which um, was in your personal folder? Ah, well, Sean hasn't done anything nefarious here. I've given him access. So uh, you can see when I've got access to Tori, uh, I might, this one here, I can click on the action menu and I can click share and I can invite people to access this file. Uh, I can require them to sign in so the file is still secure. I can get a link for it that anyone can view it or anyone can edit it and I can see straight away who it's shared with. So in this case, I just punch in Sean and because Sean's on our network, well, Office 365 tenant, I can invite him and go, 
hey, Sean, here's a great survey, and I can share that with him. He still needs to log in, so if somebody else managed to get that link, then they would need to log in with Sean's credentials to be able to access that file. Awesome. Um, Corey asks, is OneDrive mostly for individuals and SharePoint more for corporates? And Henry asks, um, is there something similar as in an app for um, SharePoint files and folders? Yes, um, we're going to look at SharePoint in a sec. Um, but yes, you can sync SharePoint document libraries through the OneDrive for Business app on Windows. You can't on Mac yet. You can, there's a beta of OneDrive for Business for Mac that you can sync files down with, but it's a little bit buggy at this stage, it's still an early beta, but on PC no problems. Um, and Leona asks, re-excel the surveys, can this be shared with people that don't have an organisation email or people outside the organisation who don't have Office 365? Yeah, so you saw before, it, when I was finished creating my survey, it just gave me a URL and I could give that URL to anyone. And when the URL that it gave me was different to the internal um, URLs, it gave me a URL which if we look at it again, only gave me access to the survey. So the person who has this particular URL that it's given me when I finished my survey um, only has access to enter their data into the survey. They don't have access to go in there and check all the responses and check out all the data. Awesome. And Patrick says, um, one question I have, our office has 10 staff and I want to be able to make contact groups and share these with all other users and also have the ability to update and edit groups and have these changes reflected. Is this possible? Yeah, you can do contacts um, and they can be shared. Uh, discard. I don't really need to invite people to that meeting. So we can make groups. Actually, I probably shouldn't be sharing that, should I? Um, let's pretend we didn't look at that. Uh, we can make groups and um, we can share contacts and things like that just fine. And Leona just asked, how do you set up an asset as in a meeting room? Uh, that's probably something for next week's more advanced webinar. This, at this point, we're just looking at um, what it can do and then next week we'll look at how to set it up and how to get started. Awesome. Keep going with the demo. Cool. All right. Well, this is SharePoint. So I can go to my sites link and I can access my SharePoint sites. So for us, this starts with our CU team site. And our SharePoint at this stage is not that complex. It can be made much more complex. You can do um, staff timesheets and advanced workflows and all kinds of different things with it. If it loads, maybe. Okay, let's try again. All right, so load the team site. So we've called it a team site, but it's basically our organizational site, and you'll be able to see all of the team sites that I have access to. I guess we're trying this again. Du, du, du. Okay, it's working really well. Cool. All right. All right. We're back in. 
starting point. So this is the login page that I mentioned before. Right, now let's try again. Looks like that tab had timed out on me. Excellent. So click on my team site. Cool, there we go. So this shows me straight away all of the team sites that I have access to. So all of our different um, teams within the organization essentially have different team sites and we can limit access to each team site according to who needs access to it. So obviously everybody in the organization needs access to our policies and procedures. So that's one that everyone will have access to. We have a programs team site. You can see that the site has documents, it has a feed, has all kinds of different things in there. And these can be made more complex. I've got a demo site that I'll show you in a sec. But you can see that here's our events one. This has been styled. So at connecting up, purple is the color that we associate with our events. So somebody's made it purple. Somebody likes a flower, so there's a flower in there. I have access to all of the documents that are associated with an event. And I can go through and I can follow through the folder structure. And this is the kind of thing that we can then sync back to our computer. And you can see that these files aren't actually, um, they're not actually Office files. So that file I just downloaded is a Photoshop document. There's a couple of um, just images, JPEGs. So I can store files that aren't Office files in here. I just can't edit them in real time with all the document functions that I was showing you before. But it is a good way of being able to back up all of those files. And what I'll do is I will go back and I'll show you my demo site. So this is where I would store organization-wide files that you want to share with everyone. The document storage for SharePoint works slightly differently in that, you remember how I said we had unlimited storage for OneDrive for Business? Well, we don't have unlimited SharePoint storage. At this point, SharePoint storage is 10 gigabytes plus 500 megabytes per user. So an organization with 20 users will have 20 gigabytes essentially because they'll have the 10 gigabytes to start with and then the 10 gigabytes from their 20 users. So the bigger the organization, the more file storage you're going to need. Um, so that's probably another reason why you might want to use OneDrive for Business instead of SharePoint for some things. If you've got um, marketing or comms people that store a lot of video assets, then that can be a really useful usage of OneDrive. Um, yeah, basically. Now, we can actually get a bit more involved with our team sites. We can use them for project management, essentially. So you can see here, I've got a blank team site. Um, I can share it with different people within the organization. By default, it's not shared, it's only shared with me, so nobody else has access to this in the organization yet. But I can then link tasks, timelines, and calendars here. So I can easily add more applications to it if I want to have, say, a site mailbox. I can have a mailbox for my demo site so that everybody in the team who's working on that project gets access to all of the emails that are related to that project. I can have a calendar. I can have all kinds of different things that I might want to put on there, which you only use the ones that are actually going to help you with your project. But I can edit my list here. I can look at my to-dos for my project. And at this stage, milestone A, a couple of weeks away. But, you know, we're tracking okay on milestone A. We could get more granular with this. We could make the milestone A and then have tasks underneath that that are going to have more like, earlier deadlines. I can assign them to different people. So I might want to give Sean a task that needs to be done as part of this project. 
Tori might need to do a task as part of the project. And then I can have my documents that are associated with the project that, I know that everyone will have access to. So I can create a new folder of important project documents. And then I can store whatever I need to in there. And I can be able to sync that back down to my computer as well. Now that's that's how you operate team sites. Now I'm not going to go into big SharePoint design because that's going to be the subject of a webinar in a couple of weeks. Now the thing with SharePoint is it's fantastic because you can do so many different things with it. But the thing with SharePoint is it's terrible because you can do so many th things with it. So what we recommend to organizations to do is do bits of all of Office 365 basically as your organization needs it and as it provides value to your organization. So a lot of organizations when they first look at Office 365, great, there's so many different things, love it. But for most organizations, the first step will be migrating email. Email is something that most organizations are using and migrating email gives people a familiar way of doing it. You can migrate email without having to use OneDrive, without having to use Skype for Business, without having to use SharePoint. And then over time, you can start adding in things as users become more familiar and as time and resources allow. So we migrated to 365 almost a year ago now and we are using SharePoint to the extent that you saw, but we're still not running a full-blown SharePoint site. That's something that's being developed or designed at the moment, but that's probably another few months away. We are starting to use Skype for business, but we're not using it for everything. Where individual users are starting to use OneDrive for business, but some other users aren't, they're using the old server still. So we have that flexibility. You don't have to jump all in straight away. So we've got a few minutes left. That's pretty much the end of the demo. So Tori, if you've got any more questions, let's get through them all. We have a heap load more of questions. They're very SharePoint orientated, so feel free to That's let um, um, people know that we do have a webinar next um, week on the 17th. But um, Matt Excellent. asks, how well does syncing OneDrive and SharePoint files on the desktop work? It works really well if you're on a, on Windows. It works pretty average if you're on a Mac at this point. But to be honest, um, the way that the, the Windows tools have progressed, I've no doubt that in a few months' time, the Mac version will be just as good. But on, the, on Windows, no problems at all. And Russell asks, versioning, how do you control the amount of data stored as this will make your data small, area smaller over time? Uh, that's a good question. I think they, there's something in the way that they do it. You can delete, I can show you, you can delete versions if it's an issue, but in general, they make up such a small proportion of your storage, you don't worry about it, because it doesn't actually store a complete duplicate of the file. It's storing just those changes. So if I go back to this file here, uh, which is the demo file we were using before, and go to my version history. Now, I really didn't like this version of Sean's. You know, not his best work. I can delete that version, sends it to the recycle bin. So I can do that if I'm really worried about the um, file storage. I can delete all the versions if I want. It may be that it's part of your organizational policy to once a file is final, you delete all of the previous versions. You can do that as well. Um, but I'm yet to see an organization that uh, needs to worry about space enough to do that. Um, Stephen has a question which may be similar to a question that was previously asked. Could somebody subscribe one E1 user and the rest Office 365 Premium and gain all the AD inter integration features? No, no. You can't have a mix of the nonprofit business accounts and the nonprofit E1 or enterprise accounts. 
in that particular scenario, you would put everybody on E1 or E3. I, I take it you're doing that so that you can get the desktop application, but what I think would probably be a better thing there would be to either just go E3 or do what 95% of organisations are doing, and that is use E1 and request the donation of Office 2013 through the donations program. And Pauline asks, can programs be stored and used on Office 365 or just files? And how does this mesh with printers that are already currently linked through a server? So if you retain your server, the printers will work the same way that they always have. Um, depending on how they're set up through your computer. If you have the same computer and you switch to Office 365, your printers will be the same. If you migrate to 365 and get rid of your server, that will be different, but that will be dependent on how that's set up. In terms of storing programs, um, depending on the program, you can probably do it, but it's not a very good idea, De especially depending on you know, some database applications, um, if you're trying to edit them at the same time, you're likely to corrupt your database. Uh, if you, some applications need to have things installed on your computer, so you'll still be able to access them through uh, OneDrive for Business on the sync tool, but they may not function because your computer won't have some of the prerequisites. So it's not something that I would recommend. Thanks, Ryan. Um, Jeff asks, I currently sync my calendar and contacts with my iPhone. How do you continue to do that? Same way you always have. You just set it up as another Exchange account, and I think that the iPhone actually automatically detects all of the Office 365 settings. It's been a while since I set it up. Um, the other thing is there is an Outlook um, version for iPhone now, um, and it's really, really, really good. So uh, that's another option for you as well. And Jeff also asks, does connecting up rely solely on Office 365 storage or do you have something local just in case the internet is down? Uh, we still have our in-house server. We haven't decommissioned it yet. We will be decommissioning it um, eventually, but uh, we're getting SharePoint organised first and we're still tossing up exactly what we're going to do uh, it's likely that we will retain something on premises in terms of data storage, simply because we have, depending on the number of part-time and volunteers we have on premise at the time, we might have 20 staff, so we'll keep a, a local backup just in case. And Matt asks, what's the difference between site collection and team site? Site collection? Uh, let me have a look. So team sites are basically designed to be for a team. You can have them for projects, you can have them for team, you can have them for whatever you need. Uh, I take it, I didn't actually see that, but there is the potential to build an organisational wide site, which would be for all staff, which can incorporate your, um, processes, your policies, your forms, things like that. Awesome. Um, and Leona asks, how do we determine how much storage we have already used in SharePoint? Uh, it should be under your administration features. You'd be able to see that. Uh, Pauline asks, probably a dumb question, but would you ever use SharePoint or OneDrive or uh, SharePoint and OneDrive, or are they mutually excuse, exclusive? Most organisations would use both. They would replace their user directory with OneDrive for Business, and they would replace their organisation's file server, basically, with SharePoint. And Russell um, just would like to have reiterated where the data is, as there is um, regarding Australian government statement that all department data has to be stored in Australia. I think the primary data storage location now is Melbourne, but I believe it's replicated to Sydney. Um, everybody who signs up to Office 365 after about March this year, I think it was, will automatically be created in Australia. Um, 
yeah, I'm pretty sure Melbourne's the primary data center. I don't think it's Sydney. Um, so your data will be kept on shore. Um, anybody who signed up to Office 365 before March will be migrated back to Australia. Um, they're still working on the process for that. And is Microsoft Office Publisher available on Office 365? No, you can do what I was saying before with the Photoshop files. You can still store your publisher files in Office 365, but publisher the program isn't available through the cloud yet. So if you have Office 2013, you can still create files in publisher, store them in your OneDrive or store them in SharePoint and share them that way and back them up. But um, at this stage, there's no timeline in which point SharePoint, uh, which point Publisher will be available on Office 365. And Mary Bell and Leona have a question going back to SharePoint and OneDrive. What are the distinctions between OneDrive where you can share files and SharePoint and how do you differentiate which would be useful for a particular task? Well, OneDrive by default, they're shared with you and you alone. They're your files. And you can manually choose to share them with other people, um, but you wouldn't share them with large groups. Whereas SharePoint, by default, they're shared with everybody who has access to that section of SharePoint. So, for example, if I shared a file in the events team site, then that would be shared with everybody who has access to the events team site by default. So, for me, if I'm working on something myself, I would keep it in my OneDrive when it's either finished or I want feedback on it or, you know, for example, this presentation, when I'm finished with it, it'll go into the events team site so that everybody's got an archive of it for the future. And that, does that explain it? I'll see if she will um, let me know, Mary Bell. Um, Leona just says, with team sites, are the documents linked back into the general um, pot or on our org? organizational site and Mary Bell says thank you all good cool so what, what was the first question there what team sites are the with the team sites where are the documents linked back to in the general pot is this on the organizational site yeah on the organizational site yeah so if you had if you had 10 gigabytes of well you wouldn't you'd have 20 gigabytes of SharePoint storage and you had a gigabyte in your events team site, then you would have 19 gigabytes left for everything else. And Rob just asked, how do you go about recovering deleted, um, well, data that has accidentally been deleted? Uh, you have access to a recycle bin. Admins have access to a bit more, but I'm not an admin here. And you can see what the file is, where it was originally stored, who created it, when it was deleted, how big it is and you can click on the file and you can restore it to wherever it needs to go. If you're running short on space and you desperately need to delete some files, then you can click the checkbox and hit delete. And final question, um, Pauline just go, asks, in what situation would you use Office 365 and keep an Office-based server? Um, there are some organisations who need there are some organisations who need an office-based server because they're running some kind of CRM. Uh, there was a question before about running applications in Office 365 that aren't Microsoft. They're probably the kind of applications that you'd still put on an on-premise server. Um, you might use remote desktop, you might use Citrix, as somebody was talking about before. Um, that's probably the biggest example that I can think of. Um, but what a lot of organisations now are doing is if they have that kind of need and they have the need to run something that can't be run through Office 365, CRMs, client information management systems seem to be the most common ones. Sometimes it's finance packages as well. Then a lot of them are now migrating those into the cloud as well using infrastructure as a service. I mentioned before that connecting up offer a discounted infrastructure as a service offering and that will basically then replace their on-premise server. Awesome, that is um, all the questions for now. There are a couple of questions that are queued, but I've just asked everyone if um, you do think of any more questions, please send them through to events at connectingup.org. Um, is there any last things you'd like to say, Ryan? No, that's it. We'll send out the slides afterwards, which have got the sign-up link in them. 
And for the more advanced stuff that it sounds like a few of you are pretty keen on, then there'll be webinars over the next couple of weeks that will really deep dive into some of that. Uh, that is correct. Um, so there will be a SharePoint webinar next week on the 17th. There is an Office 365 implementation consideration um, webinar coming up as well, I think on the 30th of September. So please have a look at our event listings page. Um, there's lots of information there um, to let you know what is going to be in the webinar. So please feel free to register for any of those. Um, as Ryan said, the slides will go out uh, within the next two days um, and they'll have a link to the recording and the slides. Um, and don't forget to check um, our website, newsletters and Facebook for any upcoming events. Other than that, I hope you all have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.